Praise the Lord, everybody. If we can stand in this place. It's good to be in the presence of the Lord. I'm thankful to serve a merciful God. I'm thankful to serve a God who loves us. The Bible says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but should have an everlasting life. I'm so thankful to serve Jesus Christ. I'm so thankful to be baptized in the name of Jesus. I'm grateful to be filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost. I'm grateful for the promise of eternal life through Jesus Christ. If you're thankful, why don't you just clap your hands this morning.
quick. We're about to do the offering, and I ain't got nothing that I can say, but there is a freedom in this place. I wonder for about 30 seconds. The Bible says, let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. I know we're all breathing. Come on, some of us might be a little lower. Some of us might be a little down. But you can find me in the valley with my hands lifted high. I wonder if we could just give him 30 seconds of praise. For no reason, just give him some praise. He inhabits the praising of his people. Why don't we offer it up? Why don't somebody give him a shout? Why don't somebody leap for joy? Why don't somebody raise their hands and say hallelujah? We magnify your name, Jesus. Come on, it ain't about what you've done for me, but it's about who you are. It ain't about anything about me, God, but I'm going to praise you because the Bible says to praise you. Hallelujah, Jesus. I'm going to enter into his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I'm going to enter into his courts with praise. Come on, it ain't about me. It ain't about me. It ain't about you, but it's about him. We magnify your name, Jesus. Hallelujah. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Amen. And there is liberty in this house. Hallelujah. And I tell you one thing, if you do find yourself in the valley and you go ahead and praise him anyways, you better get on ready to just be on that mountaintop. Come on, if you're struggling, I want you to just realize that when you can praise him and praise your way into a breakthrough, you get up out of your seat and you just start lifting your hands when you don't feel like it and the power of Jesus Christ is going to sit upon you. You need the Holy Ghost, you praise him and he'll give it to you. Amen. You need a miracle, you praise him. Hallelujah. There's power in your praise. Hallelujah. We got several different ways to give. Givelify, PayPal can be uh, found at riverbendpentecostals.com. Cash and checks can be mailed to Riverbend Pentecostals, P.O. Box 477, New Matter, Missouri 63869. The two plates here closest to the pulpit are tithing, and the two outer plates are for your offering. And we also have text to give, which is up there. I want you to say this declaration of faith with me. Upon the authority of your word, I have given, and it shall be given unto me. Pressed down, shaken together, and running over. I am a tither, and I give my offerings. I bring them into your, your storehouse. Therefore, the enemy is rebuked. The curse is broken. I live under an open heaven. You pour out upon me such a blessing that there is not enough room to receive it. We receive jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, sales and commissions, benefits and settlements, estates and inheritances, interest and income, rebates and returns, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, bills paid off, debts demolished and royalties received, my whole family saved and serving God in perfect health and abundance. Walking in divine favor and blessing. I'm blessed going in. I'm blessed going out. And all that I do will prosper in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't you praise your way as you come and give.
This is the exact thing that we were talking about this morning over in Elements class. When you have that relationship with God and you seek after Him and you seek for Him, He's going to meet you where you are. He's going to give you the answers that you desire. He's going to meet you. He's going to help you. We have to be connected to Him. This morning I was asking the Lord, Lord, what do we need to pray about as a church this morning? And the verse Second Peter 1 and 2 came up and it says, Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. You can't have knowledge of Him, church, if you don't know Him. You can't have knowledge of Jesus Christ if you don't know Him. And it brings me to the story of the seven sons of Siva. They were going out and they said that we're going to do some bad things for the Lord. We're going to do some mighty works. We're going to cast out devils. We're going to do these great things. And they ran across this one man who was possessed. And they said, we adjure you by Jesus that Paul preaches. They didn't know Jesus. They were not effective in what that they were setting out to do. But today, church, I want to I want to ask us if we could pray together that we would just strengthen our knowledge of who Jesus is, that we would strengthen that relationship of who God is in our life, that we could just grow to know Him more, that we could just grow to know more of the things of God, that we could just be influenced by Him and of His Word, and that we can just come together and that we can be with Him today. So if you have a need, just make it known by the raising of your hand this morning, but but on a, a church level, as a level of the body, let's grow today and get to know Him as He wants us to so that He can know us and that He can be with us and He can abide in us and we can abide in Him. So God, we want to come to You right now, Jesus, just to be able to, to be with You for a little while this morning, God. Lord, we just want to ask that You would help us to be able to know the things of You, Lord, to be on Your mind, Lord. God, I pray that You would just help us to to grow, Lord, that you would help us to be what you desire for us to be, Lord, on an individual level, God. Lord, you are so big. Lord, you can hold the universe in the palm of your hand, but yet, Lord, you are so small at times and so personable that you dwell within us, God, that you desire to know us. Lord, you know our thoughts. Lord, you know the things we struggle with, the things that we deal with, God. And I just want to pray, Lord, that today that we will begin a journey, Lord, to get deeper in your love, to get deeper in your mind, Lord, that we can just grow and be more like you every day that we live, Lord. Every day that you bless us with, God, let us be on your mind, Lord, and I pray that, that we're on your mind. I thank you, Lord, for everything. In Jesus' name.
conviction, to elation, faith, hope, despair. You better be feeling something. You better be knowing something.
2 Kings chapter 6, verses 15 through 17. This is a serious day in the house of the Lord today. This week I saw our children playing during church all the way up to 14, 15, 16 years old playing. And it broke my heart. Saturday is 12 hours of prayer. It is my desire that we'll have more people sign up than we ever have in the history of doing this. We will have prayer stations set up because we need a breakthrough. We have too many people sitting in church, even right now, here today, who aren't moved. They aren't touched. They don't respond. They're distracted. My dad preached a message several years ago. Obviously, he's been gone almost 27 years. Don't wake up dead on your ivory bed. Don't be rocked to sleep in the house of God. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early, I want to say we got an incredible team here. Amen. Incredible, Amen. incredible team. In, in every way, in every way. And I, I want to say how much I appreciate sweet little Scarlett. She was overwhelmed this morning. She was supposed to cover for Sister Heidi, Sister Carly, and Brother John Michael all by herself. And her mama can't drive. So <laughs> they're down to one vehicle. And uh, I, I just I couldn't pass that up. And she was upset today, but she does... She fills in for everybody back there, does a great job, and I'm thankful for our team, thankful for her, thankful again for for last Friday, uh, last Monday's uh, ministerial banquet. It was it was out of the park. But you got to be on the team all the time. That's right. That's right. Yep. That's right. Not just when it's your moment to shine. You don't get on the team once in a while. You get off it once in a while. And you need to see that. Everybody say, see that. See that. I am persuaded. I just felt a powerful move of the Holy Ghost in my own life. Brother Jerry, when I realized that after 42 years of having the Holy Ghost, 41 years, I've been missing out on some things. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, a host compassed the city, both with horses and chariots. You see the picture? When he got out of the tent and looked up, there was armies all around. Horsemen and soldiers and chariots. And his servant said to him, that's to the man of God, Alas, my master, how shall we do, or what shall we do, or what are we going to do? Do you see what's going on here? And the man of God answered, Fear not. Everybody say, Fear not. Fear not. Fear not. For they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And Elisha prayed. And this is my prayer today. Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain 
was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. For a few minutes this afternoon, I guess it's not afternoon yet, it's this morning, but it'll be afternoon. Open his eyes that he may see. We're going to pray, and I'm going to ask that you pray that prayer. Lord, open my eyes that I may see. God, in the name of Jesus, I've heard your voice today. You have saturated this place with your presence. There's this powerful spirit of conviction in here. There's a spirit of drawing. You love us, Lord. You love us so much that you gave your only begotten Son for us. And you have so many things for us, Lord, that we're not experiencing. And you haven't changed. You haven't diminished. Matter of fact, you're not even holding back. But God, that we might have our eyes open. Lord, that we may be healed in our vision to be able to see beyond what we've seen and go beyond where we've been. I pray, Lord, that you will let us come to know you in a clear way, in a pure way, in a complete way. Many of us have been living just like the disciples lived while they were with you, Lord, and we want to go beyond that. Open our understanding and open our eyes and open our mind that we may experience you in your fullness. God, there is a world out there that is hurting and there's wounded. There are people among us right now that are depressed and discouraged and afflicted. And you promised that these signs would follow them that believe. So, Lord, let us see. Let us see. In Jesus' name, God bless you. You may be seated. I read this this week, and I was surprised. No one, no one performed the miracle of opening the blinded eyes except for Jesus. No one ever made the blind see except for Jesus. The testimony of Paul's conversion might be the account or testimony most repeated in Scripture. Every time Paul got a chance to preach, he told what the Lord had done in his life. On the way to Damascus to see how many believers of what was then known as the way. Anybody read that in the Bible? They called it the way. I like it. I like it. The way. He was on his way to Damascus to see how many believers and adherents to the way that he could put in prison and thereby shut up and shut down. He was on a mission to squash out Christianity, as it were. But he has knocked off his feet, perhaps off of his, his animal that he was riding, and blinded by the light of Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus. At the time, he, not knowing who Jesus was, he says, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord wasn't reflection of Jesus, Brother Cody, but it was just a reflection that Paul was aware that somebody greater than him was in the room, if you will. The voice spoke from the light and says, I am Jesus, whom you're persecuting, and I know that it's been hard on you to kick back at what's been eaten at you, which was, of course, the death of Stephen. The first martyr of the New Testament church, undoubtedly Paul could not get the face of Stephen out of his mind, especially the way he met his accusers and his executioner and the peacefulness with which he passed away. Paul reiterates this on a number of occasions. Many different times he uses his conversion experience as a testimony. In Acts the 26th chapter, He's testifying to Agrippa, who is the Roman king over Judea and Galilee, among other places. And in this account, he gives us this charge that Jesus gave to him on the road to Damascus. He said, but rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee. He said, I'm going to deliver you from the people, that's the Jews, and from the Gentiles who are out to get you, and I'm going to send you to minister to the Gentiles. Verse 17. In verse 18 he says, the first thing is to open their eyes and to turn them 
from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified or set apart by faith that is in me. But I want you to notice that nothing was going to happen in their life till after their eyes had been opened. Before repentance, before conversion, before gaining an inheritance, before being set apart and sanctified by faith in Jesus Christ, their eyes had to be opened. First Kings chapter 18, verse 17 to 21. And it came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? And he answered and said, I have not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house, in that you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and you have followed Balaam. Now therefore send and gather to me all Israel on the Mount Carmel, and the prophets of Baal 450, and the prophets of the groves 400, which eat at Jezebel's table. He said, go and gather me 850 different prophets of Baal and those that ate at Jezebel's table and meet me on top of the mountain. So Ahab sent all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together there under Mount Carmel. In verse 21, And Elijah came unto all the people and said, how long halt ye between two opinions? Everybody say opinions. How long halt ye between two opinions? Sister Diane, this is going to blow your mind what I'm fixing to say. He said, if the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. He said, how long are you going to halt or limp between two opinions. If the Lord is God, follow him. And if Baal is God, follow him. And the people answer not a word. This is my notes and I read it verbatim. The picture painted by Elijah is one of a wishy-washy people who in certain situations they would beat their religious chest and proclaim that the Lord, he is God. And in other situations, they would line themselves up with the worshipers of false idols and bow down to man-made images of stone, of wood, or in some cases, silver and gold or other precious metals. They couldn't make up their mind if they wanted to serve God or if they wanted to serve themselves or if they wanted to serve idolatrous gods and images. They couldn't make up their mind if they wanted to stay in the presence of their creator, if they wanted to stay in the presence of their redeemer, if they wanted to stay in the presence of the one who keeps his promises or if they wanted to go out here and just feel good. So therefore, as a result... They limped. You understand he's not talking about a, a limp where your foot is hurt. But he's talking about, Brother David, that they couldn't get settled either in the camp of the Lord or in the camp of the world. They were, ah, Holy Ghost. They were incomplete everywhere they were. They were sometimes up and sometimes down in the church and sometimes up and sometimes down in the world. And their course of action had been, when I got a problem, I'll go to the Lord. And when everything gets better, I'll go back to the world. And when everything gets messed up in the world, I'll go back to the Lord. And therefore, they lived their life with a limp. They were incomplete. They were unhealthy. They were weak. They were struggling. The message Elijah is conveying that when you partially serve the Lord, your service is no different than when you partially serve the world. The Lord does not get excited when you come back to him at Sunday school or at worship. Because, Brother Larry, there is no different in your relationship with him than there is in your relationship with the world. The only reason you do either one of them is to see what's in it for me. The witness of a double mind is that you don't have consistency, nor are you healthy in either man. That's why, Brother David, I, he told the Laodicean church, I wish that you were cold or hot. At 
least you know where you are when you're cold or hot. But when you're lukewarm, you don't know where you're at. You don't know who you belong to. You don't know your identity. You don't know where you're going. You don't know where you come from. You just went from one place to the other. Hear me now as I tell you in the Holy Ghost, it is not going to be good enough to keep limping. I declare to you today as Elijah of old, how long will you keep limping back from one test to the other? How long will you go through things you got no business doing when you're with your friends and your loved ones? And then you'll come to church and you'll sit there and you'll go through the motions. I want you to know right now that you have limped so long. That you wore out and now you just sit. Hear me as I tell you the psalmist prayed unto the Lord and said, Lighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. The trouble is, is when you leap from one to the other, eventually you give out and you just stop in no man's land. He said, Paul, I want you to open their eyes. The first thing that's got to happen to anybody is you've got to see where you're at. Yes. You're praying to God to deliver you out of some messes uh, that you created. Uh, and you still wrestle around and waddle around in them. Uh, you hear this preacher today as I tell you, it's time to make up your mind. Uh, are you going to live for the Lord or are you going to live for the world? Whichever one you do, you got to do it with everything that's within you. If you're going to turn your back on God half the time, then turn your back on God all the time and at least enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. But while they were singing that song, you know something, Brother Richard? I got no problem living for him when I, hear, when I sing, he keeps every promise he makes. Woo-wee, I like it. There isn't one that is delayed. Oh, I love it. But Monday afternoon, when I've been battling the devil and hell and unregenerate people and this ornery flesh, I don't even feel like I'm going to go back to church Wednesday night. Because you see, I've been limping for the Lord and limping for the world. Is this all right? Does this make sense? The witness of the double mind is that you don't have consistency, nor are you healthy in either manner. In their lifestyle, they limp back and forth. You're not even that good of a sinner when you're doing that. They limp back and forth from worldliness to godliness and receive satisfaction or strength from either. To live for God partially is the same benefit as living for the world partially. All you get is to hang out with some good people and get a few goosebumps and feel good for a little bit and then you go home and you're wore out. Truth is, it's little more than a temporary preference. As a matter of fact, God help me preach real good without a lot of amens because I like them too much. <laughs> When you limp back and forth, it is little more than a temporary preference. Elijah calls it an opinion. I looked up in the original Hebrew word, guess what it means? Opinion. So I went to the dictionary, and the definition for opinion is a belief or a judgment that rests on grounds insufficient to produce complete certainty. The reason why you live back and forth from one to the other, here we go, Sister Stacy, you're not sure about heaven and you're not sure about hell, but you know the world feels good. You're not convicted or principled about either one. And the Bible says a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. And your home is jacked up, and your work is jacked up, and your life is jacked up, and your finances are jacked up, and you cannot find help anywhere. 
The inability to only consider a life lived with God as one option of many. I said the inability to only, or the ability to only consider a life lived with God as one option of many. To live one's life ripping from one opinion to another is evidence that somewhere I've missed out. Hear me now as I tell you again. To only consider a life lived with God as an option of many. That I can live for God, I can live for me, I can live for the world, I can live for my husband, I can live for my wife, I can live for my kids. And you keep wallowing around in the mud with your sinner children, they ain't never going to live for God. It's only an option for us. How do you know it's only an option? Because I only go when it's convenient. I only own the team when I can shine. I only do things when somebody brags on me. Because I'm in the church for what's for me. And I go to the world for what's for me. Oh, I know I'm in high cotton right now. I go to the plow of something deep right now. Because I am persuaded that I am far from the only one in this room right now that has come to the realization that I preach good, I've learned to pray, and I'm growing, Brother Shannon, but there's a whole lot more ahead of me than there is behind me. There's a whole lot more for me than what I've experienced. Because I am afraid that there are many of us who when the Lord touched us, we said, I see men walking as trees, and we took off running, and we were declared that we were healed, but there was another touch coming. We didn't stay where you at, Sister Leanne, and be honest with you and say, well, I, I see a little bit, but it ain't what I want yet. I see a little bit. I've got a glimpse of a little bit, but it ain't what I want yet. You see, I'm ready to lay this crutch down. I'm ready to lay my cane down because I lived from one preference, from one opinion to the other. But you know something, Brother David? I've learned some things about the Lord. And there is nothing in my life that can compare to Him. It's not an option living for God. It's not an option. I got options out there. But here, there is no option. It's all or nothing. I said it's all or nothing. He has been patient with us. As a matter of fact, Jesus said, he once laughed at your ignorance, but now commandeth men everywhere to repent. I have struggled with this message. I'm struggling right now. But if you're not sold out to God, there's a disconnect somewhere. There's something you can't see. There's something you're missing. Because if there wasn't, I said if there wasn't a disconnect, you'd be up there with Polycarp. And you'd be up there with Simon Peter. And you'd be up there with the Apostle Paul. And it wouldn't matter what's going on in my life. It wouldn't matter what's going on in your life. Remember that, Brother Shannon? I, I let the stuff going on in your life distract me just about as much as going on in my life. I get up here leading worship, and when you sit back there playing and on your phone and laughing and joking, I let it take my victory. I'm tired of limping. Because I can come in here well, Brother Shane, and I get reminded, oh, you're supposed to be limping. I can come in here prayed up, and I allow my faith to get knocked back. But let me tell you something, honey. I'm going to preach to you. I'm going to teach to you. I'm going to help you. I'm going to pray for you. And I'm going to grieve over you. But when the trumpet sounds, it's every man for himself. I'm not going to be lost for you. I'm not going to fall behind for you. I'm not going to miss out because of you. Amen. 
The inference is that I will serve God as long as that's the best thing for me at the moment. And I'll serve my flesh when that's the best thing for me. And then I will bow down in glory in the flesh pots of the world if that's the best thing for me at the moment. When it's just a matter of opinion, then the evidence is there that somewhere, somehow, I have become blinded to truth. Yes. Sister Amelia, you said it this morning. I've been praying this for days. For days, I have been praying. Stupid comes driving in, flying in, drops in, spoke in, watched in, listened in. Somehow, stupid gets back in my head again. And very quickly, I have learned to say, wait a minute. What sort of things are true? What sort of things are honest? What sort of things are just? What sort of things are pure? What sort of things are lovely? What sort of things are of a good report? I said, what sort of things are of a good report? We got to get delivered from love and negativity. We got to get delivered from love and the man who tell her and see what the bad news. If it's of a good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, thank for these things. Open his eyes that he may see. It happened to Eve when the forbidden fruit got in her vision and she could no longer see the blessings and dominion she was created to live in, blinded by the pleasure of a moment in the forbidden. It happened to Abraham when impatience blinded him to the promise that God would give him a son. And he went and laid with Hagar and brought Ishmael into the equation. And Ishmael's fighting today. It happened to David when he was blinded by boredom, neglected his responsibilities, and ended up in bed with a woman who wasn't his wife, nor was she available to be his wife. It happened to Judas, blinded by greed and jealousy, and he became a fool on the enemy's playground for a pitiful small amount of money. It happened to Demas, who blinded by the love of the world, forsook his ministry, serving with and for Paul. It is a weapon, perhaps the most powerful weapon in the devil's arsenal. Oh, God help me right now. See, one of the things that caused one of the crutches while we're limping is lying. Because the Lord reveals to me often, often, as you limp from the Lord's camp to the devil's camp and back, we exaggerate our illnesses. We exaggerate our difficulties to stay away from the presence of the Lord, to stay away from the church. Hear me now as I tell you, I have long since graduated from gauging our success by how many booties is in the seats. I grieve when you're not here. It bothers me when you're not here. But one monkey ain't never stopped no show. Huh? The Lord still moves and the Lord still blesses. But I want you here because you need to be here. I want you here because you need to be here. Because God's got a word for you. God's got a plan for you. God's got a dream for you. God's got a vision for you. And you're wasting it. I need you to forgive me. Many of you to forgive me. Because you're mean and you're ugly and you talk about people. And I don't know how you might react. And the Holy Ghost has told me, come to their house and, and tell them how important they are. And I was scared. And I was scared. I'm ashamed of that. I'm ashamed of that. Because I like it when everybody likes me. But you can't like me and be lost. And I can do things to make you like me. And be lost. But my prayer today is open their eyes. That they may 
received. It is perhaps the most powerful weapon in the devil's arsenal. 2 Corinthians 3, 3 through 4, and I'm just trying to survive the rest of this message. But if our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost. What does lost mean? If you don't know where you've been and you don't know where you're going, so you just limp from camp to camp, from opinion to opinion. Sometimes I love the Lord and sometimes I love the world. Sometimes I want to live for God and sometimes I don't like it. So I'm worldly. And I can make worldly justified if I squint. Because you see, I can't see it clearly. I can say it's all right. It's not all right. And if you keep on dabbling with the devil, you're going to be lost. to blind us. Lest the light of the glorious gospel. What is the glorious gospel? I was hoping you would ask. Here's the glorious gospel. You keep the promises you make. There isn't one that is delayed. If we ever start living like we sing, the devil is going to be put out of business. If we start believing that what we see is true, the enemy is going to be on total lockdown. Man, this morning I tried to change messages. I even drug out some notes from an old message that was good. The Holy Ghost wouldn't let me. Blinded. But I come to church all the time. <coughs> Blinded. I pay my tithe. I give them the offering. I even took out an envelope. Blinded. You mean I can do all of that and still be blinded? Here's that way. Look at first Samuel chapter 14. And I'm not really trying to hurry. I'm just trying to preach. Open your eyes. Open your eyes. Open your eyes. They let their kids live how they want to. And we've, we've made holiness an option. And we've made living consecrated lives an option. It's, it's an opinion. It's, it's if I don't feel convicted, I don't have to do it. And that's crazy. It's the word of God. It's the word of God. And the storm is coming. Yes. And the storm is coming. Yeah. But he that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a man who built his house upon a rock. Yeah. And the storm came and the winds blew, but it stood. Yes. But he that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not, why would you not do them? Right. Unless you were blind. Yeah. Unless it was an opinion. Unless it was a choice, unless it was an option. First Samuel chapter 14, verse 24 through 30. And the men of Israel were distressed that day. Can I get an amen? amen. And the men of Israel were distressed that day. The men of Israel. God help me preach right now, just for a minute. Just for a few more minutes. And the men of Israel were distressed that day. For Saul had adjured the people saying, Saul, backslid. Saul. Who was limping from one camp to the other. Remember, he disobeyed God. And then he told the man of God, I did everything you said. He told the people, fast. 
till the sun goes down for me. That I may be avenged. The first thing that's going to happen, Brother Shannon, when the scales come off, is I'm going to realize it ain't never been all about me. That was recovery Thursday night, in case you weren't there. And the men of Israel were distressed that day, for Saul had adjured the people, Cursed be the one who eats any food until evening, that I may be avenged on mine enemies. So none of the people tasted any food. And they were distressed, and they were weak, and they were discouraged. And then all they of the land came to a wood. And there, and there was honey on the ground. There was honey on the ground. Next verse. And when the people were coming to the wood, behold, the honey dropped. That means there was honeycomb all up above them. And it was overflowing and dropping to the ground. But no man put his hand to his mouth, for the people feared the oath. Next verse. But Jonathan, you see, Brother David, Jonathan wasn't there when Saul gave that order, don't eat. You know what he was doing? Him and. Yep, Saul bearer. Woo! Him and the armor bearer. Done been kicking booty and taking names. Oh God. And Jonathan comes and sees all this honey on the ground falling out of the trees. And he put forth the end of his rod that was in his hand, the staff that was in his hand, and he dipped it in a honeycomb. He put his hand to his mouth. And look at here what happened. His eyes were enlightened. Next verse. Then answered one of the people and said, Thy father, that Saul, straightly charged the people with an oath, saying, Curse me the man that eateth any food this day. And the people were faint. Next verse. Then said Jonathan, My father had trouble. My father had troubled the land. See, see, I pray you. How mine eyes have been enlightened because I tasted the little of the honey. Look what a difference it's made. Because I wasn't prideful and I fell down before God. With a humble heart. I tasted a little bit of the honey. And my eyes. I'm not distressed. I'm not discouraged. I'm not downhearted. I'm not downtrodden. Look what a difference has happened to me. Next verse. How much more? One had his eyes light. How much more if perhaps, that's what happily means, perhaps the people had eaten freely today of the spoil of their enemies which they had found. For had there not been now a much greater slaughter of the enemy. If you would have just got a taste of honey, it opened your eyes. It didn't fill him up. But it opened his eyes. And when your eyes are open, you see to make the right decision. You can see where you are. You can see where you are and where you need to be. Where the right place to be is. Where completion is. Where fulfillment is. Where help is. Where hope is. But not if you're blind. I 
hope you're thinking right now, my goodness, about everybody I know is blind. Think about it. Somebody comes to recovery. I'm thinking about one person in particular. They come to recovery and the hand of God gets on them and, and, and they're anointed and they're blessed and they fall in love with a loser. And they convince themselves it's the will of God. You know what they were doing? Just looking back and forth from camp to camp. They come to church and they live for God. I heard a girl say this one time. I heard she did say it. She wanted a boyfriend. She wanted a fella. She was a beautiful young girl. She was, she was so pretty. But she couldn't find her a fella that would stick. And she said, well, I tried this God's way. Now I'm going to go try it my way. Oh, she was limping back and forth from opinion to opinion. The first... God help me right now. Yesterday I yesterday I went to Daddy's cousin's funeral. And brought back all kinds of things. I remember, I think it was Thanksgiving. May not have been, maybe it was something else, but it was the first holiday after Daddy was gone. Chair was empty. It was one of the saddest things I've ever seen in my life. It was a stark reminder of what we had lost. Other people were celebrating whole, and I was limp. Perhaps you're alone. You see others happy, healthy, and complete and whole, but you're limping. I know the Lord is good and I like what I feel, but then I go home and I'm with him. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early, behold, a host could pass the city, both with horses and chariots. And his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, I see you the enemy. What are we going to do? And I've been getting beat down day after day. It's been a struggle. It's been all I can do to make it from service to service. Half the time, I don't even want to go. Several of us have quit half the time. <coughs> Limping. It's overwhelming. The tangible awareness that I'm incomplete. That I'm weak, that I'm limping. I love the Lord, but I don't have the money to buy what I'd like to for Christmas. I love the Lord, but I hope somebody invites me for dinner. I love the Lord, but life is heavy as I limp from one opinion to another. And the man of God answered, Fear not, for they that be with us. More than they to be with you. And Elisha prayed. He said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire. You just need to open your eyes. You need to pray, Lord, open my eyes. Lighten my eyes. I can't stay like this anymore. I know you're better than what I've been experiencing. I know there's more to you than what I've been knowing about. I, I know. I'm ready to stop limping and get healthy and get strong and realize that my circumstances sometimes, Brother Shannon, is just what the wilderness is. Psalms 34, 1 through 8. I will bless the Lord at all times, the psalmist said. You can't do that if you're blind. I 
preached it a couple of weeks ago. Paul and Silas, you know why they could praise the Lord at midnight? They could see that they would be with us are more than they would be with him. You see, Brother Larry, I don't believe those chariots and those horsemen just showed up for Elijah. I think they're here all the time because I preached it the week before last to you who are kept by the power of God. And that word kept means standing guard, standing at attention. I'm with you. But you know something, Brother Jerry, when I'm blind, I don't even know when the Lord's there. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. I'm going to give you a picture of what it looks like when you're not blind. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. What's that mean? I started to sing this the other night, but I don't know all the words. I was singing a little bit Friday night. Something got on me. But Helen Baylor said, as I look back over my life and I think things over, I can truly say that I've been blessed. I got a testimony. That's what that is. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble should hear thereof and be glad. What happened to the humble when you limped out of the Lord's camp back to the enemy's camp and they were watching you and they were waiting? Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Here we go. I saw the Lord. He heard. And delivered me from all my fears. They looked unto him and were lightened, and their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamped round about them that fear him and delivereth them as you stand. Oh, taste and see. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste and see. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed, happy. Here we go again, Brother David. It's the same word. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. You know why I don't stay with him? Because I don't trust him. Because I'm blind. I listen to the wrong voices. I'm watching the wrong examples. I'm reading the wrong things. I'm giving the wrong things my time. I devote my life to people that wouldn't spit on me if I was burning. But Psalm 34 said, I bless the Lord at all times. You do that if you're not blind. It says, oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Here's 
what I need to see. Remind me who I am. Remind me who I am. I'm a blood bought child of God.
pastor was talking about his dad's chair being empty and my mind went to an old white house on the corner of 5th Street in Lilburn, Missouri is my grandpa's house. Not too many months ago we went and we opened the door and for the Robbie, no one's been living there. And the roof fell in. And all of the possessions that they had and things that were left in the house. Brother Shannon, they're in shambles. Chair that he used to sit in that would tell stories to me is there with dust and mold and rotted. And his possessions and things that he cared about on this earth are gone by the wayside and people pass it every day and they think nothing else about it. I remember him telling me stories of his father that I never met or his father's father that I never met. That's not too many generations that the things that we do in this world and the things that we attain and the things that we gather together and the things we put our time and focus in that after we're gone in just a few generations, nobody remembers anything of who we were. One life to live will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. I've had people walk up to me numerous times through the years that couldn't tell you where he lived, Brother Walter. They couldn't tell you the color of the carpet that was in his house. They couldn't tell you how tall the roof was in his kitchen where I almost had to duck to get in there. But what they could tell you was, you know, when I didn't have nothing to eat one day, he showed up to my house. And I remember him telling me, Brother Robert, to grab one of them hens out of that hen house and shove it in this basket and come go with me and go get me two dozen eggs. I grabbed those things and I put them in the trunk of us, I mean in the cab of a 79 Ford black and white and we hopped in the front and we drove to a part of town where there was a lady in need that had a house full of kids with nothing to eat. And he hollered at her and she walked out and he gave her a chicken and she started to cry and he gave her some eggs and she said, Mr. Frank, I can't pay for this. And he said, that's okay. Just feel like you need it. That's the stories that I still hear every day. I'm saying that to say this, your life impacts people. Doesn't matter where you live. Doesn't matter what you drive. Doesn't matter what you look like dressed up or in a pair of bids, what does matter is what you do for the Lord while you're in this body. So I challenge each and every one of you in this place today that heard the word of the Lord to leave this place, to make your decision, choose you this day whom you will serve is what the word says. But when you leave this place today, be impactful in somebody's life. Leave it with a mindset of I'm going to be a blessing every day that I live for somebody. Amen. Can we just give the Lord a hand clap of praise and thank him for the opportunity we heard in this place today. Amen. Amen. I have a whole slew of announcements and I'm sure I'll probably mess some of them up because I need bifocals and I ain't got them yet. But here we go. Men's prayer meeting this Monday night at 6.30 p.m. Church cleaning schedule this week is team number three, Brother Johnny and Sister Tara. Riverbend kids age three through 11. The Polar Express party is today from four to 6.30 in the family center. There'll be a movie and hot chocolate and decorating Christmas cookies. Sister Stacy is taking the Sages ladies 55 and up to see Christmas lights this Tuesday evening. So you'll meet at the church at 5.30 p.m. Ladies' Christmas Banquet is this Friday, December the 15th at 6 p.m. in the Family Center. Bring $10 to, or a $10 gift to exchange. Text party to the church number, 833-883-9311, to register. We're having a socks and underwear drive for the Eagle Closet. Please, please purchase new socks or underwear. I think that's to go without saying. 
girls and boys of all ages. Next Sunday, the 17th, is the deadline. So when you get them, please bring them. And they have to be here by next Sunday. Remember about the silent auction on Facebook for the guided hunt and the fishing trips. You can either bid online or use the sheet in the back of the church. The bidding ends today. And all the money goes to Aaron Pays Fund. The renewed marriage retreat is February the 8th and 9th in Branson at the Branson Hilton Convention Center. Registration is $99 a couple. If you'd like to go and stay at the vacation rental with us, please let Brother Chris and Sister Stephanie know today. Cost is around $200 per couple. There is a QR code to be registered at the bottom of the bulletin. 12 hours of prayer is this Saturday, December the 16th. The sign-up sheet is in the back on the table, so all of you that will, please find you a spot to pray. If there's a lot of people that's full, if, if the line is full, pray with somebody else. It's okay. River Bend Ignite at Youth Convention and Youth Camp is about five months away, so please start saving your money now so you can attend that. Do we have any birthdays or anniversaries in the house this morning? Anybody have a birthday or anniversary? sing happy birthday first and then we'll do the anniversary second. Somebody's neck telling you love. 